Welcome to Questions and Answers from Quarantine with Pastor Chris McMichael. Hello there. Welcome to Questions and Answers from Quarantine. I'm Pastor Chris McMichael from Tennessee. This is episode 22. Kind of a fun question today and a, maybe a brief answer because it's not, I don't think, too difficult, though it is a lot of conjecture perhaps, but it's as good as answer as any. My question comes from one of actually our high school students who's about to go to college. He, asks, he asked me, uh, what happened to the tree of life that was in the midst of the Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve were kicked out? That's a pretty good question. We know that the tree of life was set in the Garden of Eden and then the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the Bible tells us that whoever ate of the tree of life would live forever. And then, of course, there was the, the strict forbiddance, the prohibition not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I believe that that tree of the knowledge of good and evil was set there so to give Adam and Eve a choice to serve God. Without an option, there would be no free will demonstrated and no, no desire on their own or requirement of their own to worship God joyfully and willfully. So we understand, I think, that pretty much the common knowledge, the common acceptance, the common answer across the board in Christianity is that if Adam and Eve had eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and died spiritually as they did and then run across the aisle and eaten of the tree of life, they would have lived forever, but they would have lived forever dead to God. And so for that reason, for that conjected reason, God kicked them out of the garden. It's judgment. He kicks them out of the garden, and the Bible says he set cherubim there guarding it, plural, and multiple, and then a flaming sword that turned in every direction. Some people, I guess I used to think of it as, as an angel with a flaming sword, but it says cherubims to guard it, and then a flaming sword that turned in every direction to guard the tree of life so that Adam and Eve wouldn't sneak back in there, eat, and then live forever dead to God. We know that in the moment the Lord cursed uh, Adam and Eve in creation and the serpent, he also prophesied about a coming Messiah. By the very fact that he forbid them or, or uh, prohibited them from being able to enter in, eat of the tree of life, he demonstrated he didn't want anybody to live forever dead to him. Of course, that's what's going to happen with hell. People will live forever dead to God, separated from him. But he demonstrates in that act of gracious judgment by expelling them from the garden that he didn't want anybody ever to, to spend eternity apart from him and to spend eternity dead to God. So what happens? Well, I, I believe the, the common held stance, I believe it, I hold it, is that when the flood came, because Noah's flood happened about a thousand years later, when the flood came, it would have been wiped out. Uh, the flood covered the whole earth, the Bible tells us. It would have wiped out that tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. What we begin to see after the flood, and, and as the flood subsides and mankind begins to rise again and, and do its thing, we begin to see foreshadows or types and shadows of the tree of life throughout Scripture. The first one you see is Exodus 15, when... <clears throat> Moses is leading Israel through the wilderness, and they come to the waters of Merah, and Merah means bitterness. So here we have bitter waters, and we understand uh, nutritionally and, or maybe hydrologically, if you drink these bitter waters, you'll die, you'll perish. Maybe it's a salt brine, maybe it's a salt flat, we don't really know for sure. We just know they can't drink these waters. If they drink these waters, they will die. These are death waters, except the Lord shows Moses a tree that if he'll take this tree, Exodus 15, 23, if he'll take this tree and throw it into the waters, the waters will be made sweet. And so by taking this tree, we could call it a tree of life, and throwing it into deadly waters, he makes the bitter waters sweet, and now Israel can partake of living waters and live. Pretty good foreshadow. Then we see again in the book of Numbers when, when Israel complains and the Lord sends fiery serpents and they begin to be bitten and die, the Lord tells Moses, if you'll cast a brazen serpent, brass represents sinfulness. If you take this brazen serpent, put it on this pole, lift this stick up, anybody that looks to the serpent on the pole shall be healed. We could call that a foreshadow of the tree of life. Jesus Christ references the serpent on the pole um, when he's talking about how if just like that serpent on the pole was lifted up, he said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. And so he is that serpent on the pole. 
Here's where we can use a double allegory. Serpents don't just represent the devil. Here the serpent represents sin. Jesus Christ was made sin. He hanged on a tree. It was hung on a tree that he might redeem us. So we see the brazen serpent on a pole. Some medical communities still use that serpent on a pole to indicate healing. Others use the caduceus staff, which is a, a Greek mythology thing, um, which is a, two serpents and wings. Uh, I think EMTs use the singular serpent on a pole. You can go look at it later. So there we have a foreshadow of the tree of life. Then, honestly, we have the cross. The cross is the ultimate tree of life. Even as Deuteronomy says, and it's quoted in 1 Peter 2, or excuse me, Galatians 3, cursed is every man that hangeth upon a tree. So hanging on that tree, for when Jesus Christ did, it brought life to whosoever will. So now we see the cross of Calvary as the ultimate tree of life. And whoever goes to the cross and whoever receives of the gift of life, they live forever now. Jesus Christ says, because I live, you'll live forever. Uh, so we see that, but ultimately we see the tree of life again in heaven. My personal belief is, and I, I don't know if you could ever debate it, so I think it's right. Everything on earth is modeled after everything in heaven. The fact that we see a tree of life in heaven would indicate it was probably there first, and God set one in the garden as a reflection. Uh, it's kind of like if, um, if you go overseas into the foreign fields and you go to an American embassy, that American embassy on the inside is going to look a lot like the U.S. of A. Because that's U.S. territory. And so you might even have um, American television piped in there. You'll have American-styled furniture in there. The food will be Americanized. You could be in, in Bangladesh. You could be in Calcutta, India. But you go into a, an American embassy, you're probably eating burgers and hot dogs. You're probably eating steaks and baked potatoes. Because... An embassy is a reflection of home. And earth, <clears throat> in like fashion, is a reflection of heaven. And why was there a tree of life in the Garden of Eden? Because there's a tree of life in heaven. And because they ruined it, Adam and Eve blew things with the tree of life. There had to be multiple trees of life to get us back to heaven, to the tree of life. Hopefully you follow that. So here in Revelation 22, verse 2, John the Revelator observes in heaven, in the midst of the street of it, Let's look at verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Sounds like John 4, John 7, the, the, the well of salvation springing up, rivers of living water, life coming out of us. Sounds like Exodus 15, bitter waters being made sweet and life coming out of them. In the midst of the street of it and on the, either side of the river was there the tree of life. So that kind of reads funny in the King James. In the midst of the street of of it, and on either side of the river was a tree of life. How big is this tree? In the midst of it, and on either side of it. Is this tree so big? I mean, do we think of like a little tree sitting in the Lowe's parking lot with a root bag on it? Or maybe this tree is so big, its roots span both sides, maybe like a banyan tree or a baobab tree. Its roots span both sides of the river. The river flows through it, and roots go in the middle. Maybe the river runs through the roots. Why do trees in heaven need roots? Why do we even need trees in heaven? I have no idea. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. It was the tree of life, which uh, bare 12 manner of fruits. And it sounds like one for every tribe. And yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Apparently there are still nations, even in future dispensations. Look at verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. And now we're talking about the holy Jerusalem. So perhaps now the tree of life comes down and it's in the midst of Jerusalem. We see the tree of life again in heaven, perhaps in the heavenly Jerusalem that comes down and sets on planet earth. But one last verse here. God promises the overcomers. Jesus Christ promises the overcomers in Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. He says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So that lets us know that tree of life is in heaven. Why was it in the earth? I believe it was in the earth as a reflection of what heaven is really like. Uh, Eden was supposed to be heaven on earth. Where, where's your blueprint coming from? It's coming from the real thing. So to answer the question, what happened to the tree of life in the garden? I believe it was wiped out through the flood. 
though we saw typologies of it throughout the scriptures, ultimately with Christ on the cross, and the tree of life is still in existence in heaven today in the paradise of God, but it appears that it will also come down with the heavenly Jerusalem, and you'll have access, if you obey God, you'll have access to that heavenly city, that holy city, and to the tree of life. Hopefully that answers that question. I think it's a fun question. Like I've been sharing with you, these questions are all over the dartboard. They're not just coronavirus, quarantine, into the world related. Some of these are just honest questions about doctrine, things people are studying and just wanted an answer for. Appreciate it. Call you blessed. Kind of a shorter episode, but there you have it. Hopefully you become an overcomer. Hopefully you're obedient and you get to partake of the tree of life. If you haven't yet, I'd encourage you to go to the cross of Calvary, the best tree of life we have on earth right now, and receive of the tree of life and of the fruit through Jesus Christ the only name given unto man whereby we must be saved. Amen. See you next time.